from the notes, if you have a handout, the title of today's lesson is Surrendered. Such a great topic, isn't it? <laughs> so I would like to begin by reading the definition of surrender, which is to yield, to give up completely, to cease resistance, to give oneself up, to give oneself over, to give oneself up into the power of another. Also, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, um, some synonyms of surrendered, abandonment, submission, and yielding. And as I was looking up the definition and synonyms, I ran, I just thought of the word humble. And part, one of the synonyms for humble is submissive. So there is a connection between us humbling ourselves and us surrendering ourselves to God. In Psalm 55, 22, from the NIV, the word of God says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be moved. Cast your cares. That is an act of submission to give up, to cease resistance. Cast your cares. And his promise is that if we do that, he will sustain us. He doesn't say, I'll take it completely away. He just says, I will sustain you. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 29 from the NIV, the word of God says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 goes on to say, Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In the word of God, this is written in red, which means Jesus himself is the one saying this. We are called to be humble and gentle. And why do I say that? Because in the word of God, as we read it, we are to be like Jesus. And here in this verse, he says, I am humble and gentle. So we are called to be humble and gentle, just as Christ is humble and gentle. Part of being humble is surrendering. We are called to surrender. I want you to notice the words come in verse 28 and take in verse 29. He says, come to me, take my burden. Those are actions that are on us. He is telling us, come to me. We are to go to him. Take. We are to take our burden to him. God does know and he understands everything that we go through. But there is action on our part. In our walk with the Lord, we have a choice. We can either sit there and do nothing, which means we are not and will not grow in our relationship with him. Or we can take one step at a time toward the cross, toward God, surrendering each step that we go. And in Matthew eleven thirty, and I did not put this on the notes, but the promise, if you want to call it a promise, that he says for us coming to him and taking on his yoke is that, why does he want us to do it? Because in verse 30 it says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because when we take it to him, our burden then becomes his burden. And we know that anything that God touches, he is capable and more than able to handle it. 
which makes the burden light. He's not going to, once again, take it all away because in the process of our humbling ourselves and in the process of us surrendering ourselves, there are things that he needs to hone within us and sharpen within us to make him, to make us more like him. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and this is from the New American Standard. The Word of God says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The verse goes on to say that who loved me and gave himself up for me. The fact that we can be one in Christ is because God's unending, deep, deep, love for us. Because he loved us, he made it that we can be one with him. And we can be one with him as long as we are crucified with Christ. In James chapter 4 and verses 7 and verse 10, the word of God tells us in verse 7, submit therefore to God, and what will happen when we submit ourselves to God is that the devil will flee from us, but we also, in submitting, have to resist. So we surrender to God, but we resist the enemy. Verse 10 goes on to say, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and his promise is he will exalt you. So, in that he will exalt you, he is going to lift you up out of your circumstance so that you can see things from a different angle. Exalt you. How the word of God says in Psalm 23, in the presence of my enemies, he prepares a table. Like Kevin talked about, um, I think he may not have mentioned it, but him and I had talked about at um, Jonathan's son that David said that he could come and sit at his table. All he did was he was the child of Jonathan. All we are are the child of the Most High King. He will exalt us. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, in Mark 8, 34, and also in Matthew 16, 24, the word of God in those three verses from those three different books pretty much say the same thing. And it is, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So right here, God is telling us, you must deny yourself. You must. And it still is a choice. We don't have to deny ourselves. But if we want to grow in our relationship with the Lord and become closer and deeper in our relationship with him, it is a must. We must deny ourselves. We must take up our cross daily and we must follow him. Kevin did teach on this uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple times ago, and this take up your cross. We are to take up his cross. Why are we supposed to take up his cross? Nothing really good happened there. What well, depends on where you're coming from. As a child of God, something good did happen there because when he died, he set us free from the bondage of sin and death to be able to reign with him forever. When we take up our cross, we are putting to death the things that are not pleasing to God. And it is a daily working out of our salvation. We are human beings. God tells us that we are to be like him, but in our humanness and in our own flesh, we cannot. So therefore, we daily have to take up his cross and daily have to follow him. Daily, we have to put to death anything that gets in the way between us and him. 
1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourself. If you want God to exalt you, if you want God to lift you up out of the pit, you need to submit, you need to humble yourself. Um, I'm going to stop right here. Um, I forgot to ask Pastor Mark to open in a word of prayer, so I'm going to have him do that right now. Will you open us in a word of prayer, even though we already started? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Oh, we did open in a word of prayer, but maybe we needed more prayer right now. Okay, excellent. So let's go on. Even Jesus surrendered himself. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, we see the word of God says that being found in appearance as a man, he, referring to Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So even Jesus had to surrender himself. The son of the most high God had to surrender himself. The human part of him needed to surrender himself. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, the word of God says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. He who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Right there, that verse is telling us that we can have oneness with God, but in order to have that oneness, we need to join ourselves with God. So from these verses that I have read, we can see that surrender is oneness with God, Surrender is rest in God. Surrender is not fighting and saying, I'm done running this part of my life. Surrender is listening and learning without conflict. It is a change of heart. It is denying self. Surrender brings and is a calmness and a quiet. Surrender is peace. Surrender is freedom. Surrender is a lifelong process of yielding all of ourself that we know to all of God that we know. And I say that because as we grow in our knowledge of God, we discover areas that we thought were given to God that were not. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So as we grow in our relationship with God, where it says that we discover different things about God. You know, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we surrender and say yes to him, but it's not done. Because then as we get deeper into our relationship with him, as we get deeper into the word of God, as we spend more time reading the word of God and spend more time in prayer just talking to God, we discover traits about him that we did not know in the beginning. And then as we discover things about God that we are able to deep, grow deep in our trust with him, that we are able to understand an aspect of his love for us and that we know that he is going to be faithful, that he is not going to forsake us, God is then able to reveal areas of our heart 
areas of the center of who we are that need to be dealt with, that need to be honed, that need to be sharpened to be more like him. If he allowed us to see that at the beginning of our walk with him, we probably wouldn't do it. But he knows when we are able to handle certain things in our life. We see examples in the word of God. And there are more than what I have listed here. But of course, Jesus is an example of someone who continuously humbled and surrendered himself. As it said in Philippians 2.8, the word of God told us that he humbled or surrendered himself to the point of death. Peter, I love Peter. Peter, he obeyed Christ initially, like without any question. Christ said, come, follow me. Peter left his boat, followed him. He also, when Christ told him, go out, he had been out all night trying to catch fish, hadn't caught anything. And Christ said, go, go back to where you were at and let your net down again. Peter obeyed without hesitation. Peter was referred to as a rock, but Peter was very strong-willed. He was bold in what he would say. And sometimes when he was bold in what he would say, sometimes what he said shouldn't have come out of his mouth. Because sometimes they were statements that, you know, was like, really? You're willing to do that? And even though these aspects of Peter were there, Peter had not totally surrendered his old self. He denied Christ three times, even though before he had said, I will go with you wherever. And Christ is like, Peter, you need to like sort of watch what you're saying, pay attention to what you're saying. Right after that, Peter denies Christ three times. And why did all of this happen? Peter had already surrendered to God. He was following him. He had been with him for a decent period of time. But there was something within Peter that God needed to sharpen in order for Peter to do what God wanted him to do. Peter had to come to a place in his relationship with God where he had obedient surrender of his will. And we have to get to that point too in our walk. That is where Christ brings us and wants us to be. We see this in Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Mary, when the angel comes to her and says, you are going to have a baby, and the baby's going to be by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to become, it's going to come on you, and you're going to find out that you are with child. Well, during that time period, that was not a good thing for Mary, because she was unmarried, and people did not look very nicely or highly on unmarried women carrying a child. And Joseph didn't have to marry her. In fact, we know that Joseph was having second thoughts. But Mary's comment and Mary's response to the angel of the Lord was, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. How many times in our life does Christ come to us and God, we know God is dealing with us and within our heart about a situation that he wants us to surrender an area of our life. And how many times do we say, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I know for me personally, I do not do it 
enough. It may, I may have to go around the mountain about 10 times before I'm like, fine, fine, let your word in me be fulfilled. But it's not immediate. We see this with Abraham. In Genesis, you can find the story of Abraham in Genesis 22, 1 through 18, where God comes to Abraham and he doesn't ask. He pretty much tells Abraham, I need for you, Abraham, to go and sacrifice your son Isaac. When you, if you have time today, go and read that account because Abraham's response was he did it. Abraham obeyed without protest. His response to Isaac when Isaac asked, where's the sacrifice, Dad? And Abraham's response was, Isaac, God will provide. No one that God had provided Isaac at the time. Abraham had already surrendered in sending Hagar and Ishmael away. And now here Isaac is, a little bit older, and God's asking him, please take Isaac and sacrifice your only son through Sarah. So Abraham obeys, and he begins to prepare for the trip. How willing are you to prepare for a trip? Maybe you only have one child. Nancy, with all with the seven children that you have, what if God came to you and said, Nancy, I want you to start preparing items because I need for you to go sacrifice one of your kids. Would we obediently surrender and be like, God will provide and not question his motive or his reason why? Most likely not. So as we read this event that is taking place between God, Abraham, and Isaac, Abraham seems calm and unquestioning, even though God had just said that through Isaac, he would establish his covenant. Now, for me, I would be thinking, well, Lord, you want me to surrender, and you want me to obey you, but you just told me that the covenant is going to be established through Isaac. So how can that be if Isaac isn't here on earth. So who knows what Abraham's thinking process was, but he did it anyway. And I'd like to read Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, because I love what happens between Abraham and God. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. And we see right here foreshadowing of what would happen with Christ and how God gave up his son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So because Abraham surrendered to God, and did exactly what God had asked him to do. God tells him, in your seed, all the nations shall be blessed. All the nations. That's us today. All the nations shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. 
Unflinching obedience shows true surrender. So what are things that hinder us from surrendering? So before I go through that list, I would like to read from Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And this is from the New Living Translation. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And we know that that is a list of the fruits of the Spirit. So I think that we can come to the conclusion and say that everything opposite of the fruit of the Spirit would be a hindrance in our surrendering to God. Like unforgiveness, anger, selfishness, a lack of discipline, being unkind, meanness, control. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, gives us a list of our sinful nature. These can be a hindrance, a hindrance to our surrendering to God. He lists sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling. And this is not just a typical little disagreement. This is a contentious spirit. This is someone who seeks to argue and cause trouble amongst others by quarreling. It is more than just a little disagreement. Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy. And that envy, part of the definition, is an embittered mind. An embittered mind. How can we be at peace? And how can we have a sound mind if we are continually walking in envy? If we are continually walking in an embittered mind? And the last on the list is drunkenness. So, if there is no change in your actions, there has been no surrender. God will continue to get rid of everything else we lean on until it is only him. So, well, I'll have to ring this one. So, just recently, and this has happened on more than one occasion in my life, which is a good thing because that means God was taking an area of my heart that needed to be changed and made to respond more like him. So just recently, all of you who are here know that Sarah has been engaged for, I think, going on two years. But she has been with Patrick for about eight years. Okay, when they get married November 14th, they will have been together for nine years. Nine. That's a long time. In them being together, and I do have permission from Patrick to share this, by the way. In that relationship, I, he didn't quite meet. And that's probably an understatement. He did not quite meet my expectation of what I felt Sarah should have in a husband. And you notice I said I, what I felt Sarah should have in a husband. So in my heart, I felt a certain way. And me being one who doesn't control situations or anything, which is not true, I can be a control freak. I began to drop little comments about what my opinion was or what I didn't agree with. 
And I did that for years and years. So needless to say, that clouded what I saw. It also became the elephant in the room. I was not bearing all things, as we see 1 Corinthians 13 tells us about love bears all things. I was not bearing all things. I was unkind in my heart, and I was rude. Now, in my mind, I thought, ah, no one can tell, because that's how I feel inside. My actions aren't showing that. People, if you think that your actions do not come out based on how you really feel in your heart, you have a rude awakening. Because if we feel a certain way in the seat of our emotions, in our will, it is at some point in time going to display itself through our attitude and maybe even in our actions. Yeah, I would be like, you know, Sarah needs to know this stuff. So pretty much I was saying, well, you know, God, like I know that you gave us Sarah. I know that she is your child, but I think you need a little help in this situation right here. My actions did not cover what I felt in my heart. The aroma I was leaving was stinky in my relationship with Patrick and with Sarah. And I was making our home an unsafe environment for Pat. Who am I to decide what is best for her? That is God's job. I was making my, our home not the safest place on earth for Pat. In my quiet time, I would pray, oh God, would you please break down any barrier of pride that stands between you and I? A friend of mine at work a couple years ago gave me the verse Ephesians 4.29 because I had been sharing with her my disappointments and my, how my expectation wasn't being met. And she gave me the verse Ephesians 4.29 which says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial to those who hear it. Yeah, 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 right. So I did. I started praying that verse. I also would pray, and there's a list of verses I have, but one of them was Jeremiah 33, 6, where it says, where it says Behold, I will bring it health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. Something happened within my heart two and a half to three months ago. And everything that I had been praying and asking God for clicked. I fully surrendered that area of my life to God. So where it says when you surrender, there is calmness and quiet, there is peace, there is freedom. There was a calmness and quiet and a peace and a freedom in my relationship with Pat, and in our home when he would come over, and also in my relationship with my daughter. You know how Pastor Mark says, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Well, if we want to be right, we are not going to submit. We are not going to surrender. If we want to be happy, we are going to surrender to the Lord. So, I have come to know Pat in the last two and a half to three months better than I have in the last eight years. How sad is that? All because I refused to surrender. And all because I felt that I knew best. Who am I? Who are we? We have not created the universe. We have not created the earth. We have not hung the stars in the sky. Who are we to tell God what is best? And why we shouldn't surrender that area to our life. 
I do not want to be the reason that someone does not come to a relationship with God or is not able to walk fully in the gifts that God has given to them. So I ask you today, what is God dealing with you about? What area or areas of your life are you not surrendering to God? Is it anger, bitterness, hate, unforgiveness towards yourself or to someone else? What sin or grudge are you petting or nursing? I was petting and nursing a grudge, and he did nothing to me for eight years. Are you the reason someone is not experiencing the love of God through you? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For I have not given you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of love, power, and self-control. So if there is an area that you are not surrendering to God, I ask you today to surrender to God and clear the clog, allowing the Holy Spirit to fill you with all power so that his love may flow freely through you, enabling you and others to experience the fullness of God. The only way that can happen only way is through submission and surrender to God. That is all that I have. Are there any questions or comments?